Okay, welcome back to Architecture 445. Uh, this is the second and third part of Lecture 1 on long spans. In the first part, we talked about the basic definitions of long spans, what they are quantitatively, qualitatively, uh, why we might shift our way of thinking about structure when we get to bigger spans, and what some of the advantages and disadvantages to thinking uh, in that way would be. Today we'll get in a little bit into classifications. So we'll look at our four structural classifications that we've used to talk about things like uh, beams and roofs, and we'll look at what happens when we kind of push those systems uh, into long span territory. So the same definitions that we've used before, form active, section active, vector active, and surface active. And then we'll also look at some basic geometries, uh, particularly what happens, uh, what the difference is between what we call a one-way system and a two-way system, uh, how these are different and, and when we uh, use one or the other. So to get started, we'll talk about classifications, uh, different types of long span structures, uh, and how we, um, uh, how, we, how we think about these. We'll go into more detail throughout the semester in each of the four, but today I just want to cover the, the sort of standard definitions, uh, sort of a preview of what we'll be talking about as we, as we dive in a little more deeply. We've looked at these a little bit before when we talked about uh, uh, structural systems, beams, girders, slabs, and foundations. We had talked a little bit about uh, how we use sections to resist loads, how we use forms like arches or cables to resist loads. And we had mentioned things like shells and, uh, and surface systems, but hadn't gotten very much into them. We've also talked a little bit about vector resistant uh, structures, mostly trusses. Uh, but we'll look in this uh, class at how we kind of hack these, how we um, combine some of them, how we push some of the definitions or some of the, the, um, the ideas behind these, these systems uh, into sort of long span territory. For the most part, it's good to just remember that there are these four ways that we can use shapes uh, to uh, to, to resist loads, in particular spanning loads, right? Loads that we're carrying over uh, a space. Section resistant uh, structures basically are beams where we're using the, the depth uh, of, a, of an element uh, to carry the load. When we're talking about form resistant, we're usually talking about uh, cables and arches. Uh, vector resistant, again, we're looking at triangulating a shape, turning it into a truss, and then surface resistant, we haven't really talked about because it's a little more complicated, and that's really some of the fun stuff that we'll get into uh, here in a couple of weeks. Form active long spans, these are some of the first things that we talked about because they're some of the simplest to understand. And here what we're usually talking about are the, the shapes that are most efficient at carrying a load over a span. So we looked a lot at cables because those are the, the most straightforward, pure tension elements that adopt a funicular shape naturally. When we hang a cable from two supports, it is going to find the most efficient shape it can. It's called a catenary shape, remember, this kind of inverted uh, arch, almost a parabola, but not quite. And it is the shape that uh, the, the cable uh, takes to carry its own dead load. If we load that cable evenly, we'll find the same shape. It may be a different amplitude, but it'll be the same curvature uh, because we're putting the same amount of load on each kind of uh, piece of the cable. So simply uh, loaded cable or a cable under its own dead weight takes these very natural shapes. We've looked at a couple of examples of these. Uh, here, Gunnar Burkitz's Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis may be the most famous building example uh, of, a, of a form active system. On the right, a couple of more sort of experimental or, uh, or, or theoretical versions of this, where we're looking at cables that are kind of self bracing, right? And remember that we talked briefly about the, the kind of problems with cables being flexible, right? With the, or the, the problems with long spans being their flexibility. And in cable structures, this is really key. Um, cables are floppy and they can blow around in the wind. When we talk in more detail about form active long spans, we'll look at 
uh, particularly these double uh, cable systems where we're using cables to resist not only gravity loads, but we're using a, a paired cable to resist the uplift that we worry about uh, from, from wind loads. When we uh, sort of hack cable structures, um, what we find is that uh, by introducing a, a second axis of curvature, we go from a form active to something that's between form active and surface active. And we'll talk about the, the kind of incredible benefits we get structurally from this, but also the difficulties in fabrication and even just in calculation. Uh, when we add a second dimension of curvature, we get exponentially more efficient structural behavior. The trade-off is that that complexity is more difficult to understand uh, and certainly to, to calculate. But we're maybe used to seeing uh, these type of form active uh, systems, cable arches that go in a couple of different directions, particularly in the, the fabric structures or the membrane structures that were developed by uh, Fry Otto and others in the, in the 1950s and 1960s. The one that we're probably most familiar with uh, in terms of theory is section active because we took a lot of time to explore how we use the section of a beam to span over a, a, a long space uh, a couple of classes ago. And you probably remember going deep into beam theory and talking in particular about how we use a principle called section modulus. And we'll go back and we'll look at this, not so much to calculate uh, section modulus, but to look at that principle, that, that in, a, in a beam, it's not just how much cross-sectional area you have, but where that area is in the beam. And you might remember that section modulus is uh, measured in inches cubed. One of those inches is the, is the, or two of those inches, sorry, are the amount of area in the beam. But that third factor, that third uh, inch, if you like, in the inches cubed that we measure section modulus, remember is the average distance of that area from the centroid or from the neutral axis. I'm sure that this is bringing back fond memories now uh, of beam theory. But if you think about it, we can use that principle to kind of not only design efficient beams, and remember this is how we end up with the W shape or the I beam, a way of putting the beam's material as far from the neutral axis as we can. But we can also use this to, to uh, do what I, I think of as hacking beams, right? Trying to find ways to make them more efficient. Remember in the first section of this lecture, we talked about how long span theory is all about trying to get the performance while reducing the weight. And so if you think about how we might hack a beam, um, one of the easiest ways to do that is to castellate it, right? To take out the material around the neutral axis. And in the, the beam examples on the left here, um, you can see that they have come in and they've actually cut these circles out of a, a typical I-beam or a typical W shape in the area where that material is doing the least amount of work, right? The material closest to the neutral axis. And if you want to think about this in theoretical terms, um, where that, 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 uh, that third inch in the section modulus uh, calculation is closest to zero. So you might have a lot of area, but if it's close to the neutral axis, it's contributing very little to the section modulus um, because that, that factor is approaching zero as you get closer and closer to that, to that axis. So we can hack beams. We can take dead weight out where it's doing the least amount of good uh, and that's less weight that the beam has to carry. If you think about this beam on the left, you've now added in the capacity to carry more live load because you've reduced the beam's dead load. And one particularly kind of um, interesting or, or, or sort of fun application of this is what we call folded plates. Um, here's an example on the right of a folded plate structure. We will look at how we can use these shapes um, like if you took a piece of paper and folded it into an accordion, we'll look at how those kind of shapes actually mimic beam behavior, right? Using a very, very thin plate, but giving it some folds, giving it some depth that in turn gives it some section modulus, some capacity to carry loads uh, over spans.
The second type that we'll look at uh, are vector active systems, and these are trusses uh, triangulating a, a shape to span over a distance. Um, we can make these trusses any shape we want. We've looked a little bit at rectangular trusses, but we'll look at, again, how we kind of hack trusses or combine them with other long span types to make even more efficient shapes. So on the right, this is an example of a truss arch. And no great secret here, it combines the, the behavior of a truss, a vector active system, with that of an arch, a form active system. And if you look at this and sort of squint at it, um, this arch actually even looks a little bit like a beam, right? So maybe even three examples, you can see that it gets deeper where the, the bending moment is going to be greatest in the middle. It tapers down to points where the bending moment is going to be least at the ends. Uh, so this, this one on the right is all kinds of things hybridized together, right? A little bit of an arch, a little bit of a truss, a little bit of a beam. And we'll also look at, again, what happens when we go from a one-way arch to a two-way, or a, sorry, a one-way truss to a two-way truss. And instead of uh, having a simple truss, we have what we call a space frame, a, a, a truss that works in two dimensions. And here's an example of that uh, on the left. We'll talk about why that is even more efficient uh, and, and how we gain uh, the ability to span by letting the, the loads flow in two directions through a, a truss system instead of just one. When we hack uh, vector active systems into space trusses or wrap them around a curved surface, again, we get some uh, greater uh, efficiency and we end up uh, having to deal also with greater complexity. So on the left, this is an example of a, a vector active space frame that um, has some things going for it that a, a normal space frame uh, might not. You can see there are a couple layers uh, of truss that are kind of overlaid. And on the right, a geodesic dome, which is basically just uh, taking a, a, a two-way a two truss or a space frame and wrapping it around uh, a, a, a doubly curved surface, in, in this case, a, a sphere. And we'll talk about why that is so efficient, um, what's kind of magic about it, and also um, what, what we kind of think of as, as being a sort of magic structural performance that actually is, is pretty simple, right? Why a geodesic dome is not um, as, uh, as kind of complicated as it sounds in principle. Although having to go out and build one or having to go out and calculate one is necessarily uh, complicated, right? That's one of the ways that geodesic domes uh, gain their effectiveness or gain their efficiency. And we'll look a look at a number of examples uh, of that and how they, how they work. And then finally, the, the kind of, um, uh, I, th I think the most fun examples of long span uh, systems are surface active. And these are really genuinely long span. We haven't really looked at surface active systems yet uh, because they are uh, so closely related to long span principles. We don't use these for shorter spans. We don't use these usually for multi-story buildings. Surface active systems are the, are the one like true long span uh, structural type. And we will look at um, what happens when we introduce the, the principle of double curvature uh, and, and we come up with structures that actually work not through their sections, not through a vector, not through their kind of cross-sectional shapes, but through this principle of double curvature where we have a, a, a solid, very, very thin element uh, that has two axes of curvature and how if we reinforce that properly, we do get this almost sort of magic structural behavior that lets that very, very thin shell uh, carry a load over a very, very long distance. And we'll look, as we've said earlier, at the, at the problems not only of calculating these, they are uh, what we call hyperstatic. They work in a number of very different redundant ways, and they're almost impossible to, to calculate for sure. We use other principles to figure out uh, how to size them. And we'll also look at some of the difficulties of constructing them uh, and why these structures in particular are much easier to build now than they would have been even 15 or, or, or 20 years ago. And then finally, we'll look at some really fun structures where we're, again, hacking a number of different principles together. 
or we're finding ways to sort of cheat in, in, in creative methods. And these include fabric structures. So what happens when we take a, a, a one-way cable structure, and as I mentioned before, turn it into a two-way cable structure, and, and the, the sort of um, magic of double curvature comes in and we get uh, structures that are super efficient, right? Sometimes only uh, you know, a sixteenth or, or an eighth of an inch thick that can nevertheless span hundreds of feet. And we'll also look at what happens when we actually throw energy into the system, uh, particularly in the form of air pressure to make tension structures that can span uh, really almost a, a kind of infinite uh, dimension. Uh, pneumatic structures are the, the most effective structures that, that we uh, can think of. They have, of course, the, the problem that we have to turn them on, right? We have to flip a switch. We have to add energy to the system uh, to keep them going. And we'll look at some of the benefits and also some of the drawbacks uh, of using a system like that. Those are our kind of basic classifications, right? Uh, the, the four that we've looked at previously, but applied now to much bigger spans uh, and to the principles that we talked about earlier, about looking for ways to uh, reduce weight as much as to increase effectiveness, uh, looking for ways to hack these ideas uh, or to hybridize them, to come up with kind of new, slightly more exotic structures uh, that, can, that can extend longer and longer spans. The other way we think about these, and the, the kind of third and final part of this first lecture on long spans, is to understand this principle of one-way systems versus two-way systems. And we've looked at this a little bit already when we talked about the difference between beams uh, and slabs. Right? Beams are a one-way system where we're looking at one axis, trying to calculate the, the way that a beam is going to carry a load over a single direction. And we talked about how when we set those principles at right angles to each other uh, and think about loads flowing in two directions, we get this added effectiveness, right? this added efficiency. Uh, because the load has redundant pads uh, and the, the, because the, the deflection of, a, of, a, of two beams set at angles to one another, uh, the, the deflection is dependent on those two uh, directions. Uh, we get this added efficiency when we go from one way to two way systems. So what do we mean by this? Well, <clears throat> if we think about uh, on the left here, uh, section active principles, we had looked at, at the basic principle of a beam, and we had talked about uh, the fact that we could take that beam and kind of extend it, right? That, that we could just make a series of one-way uh, beams if we wanted. But when we looked at, for instance, a, a, a waffle slab, right, or, or what we called a two-way slab, we set those beams at right angles to one another. The loads can go in two different directions. When we put those loads onto a slab, though, the slab can only deflect one amount at any given point, right, because it's a monolithic slab. And so what we find is that those two directions, uh, by sharing the load, actually increase the resistance of the structural element, not only to breaking, right, makes the, the slab stronger, but also to deflection, makes the slab stiffer. And this is the principle behind a, a waffle slab. If we take simple beams uh, and set them at right angles to one another, we get this added resistance to, to load, what we call two-way uh, action. Well, we can do the same thing with form active structures. We can take a, a simple arch that spans in one direction, and if we want, we can extrude that arch. We can make it into what we call a one-way system or a, or a vault. Um, we can do things to the edges of that vault that, that make it span uh, in the long direction or the short direction, whichever we want. Or we can take the same principle that we used to turn beams into slabs. And we can turn that arch into a, a doubly curved system. The one we think of right away is a dome, where we simply take the arch and rotate it uh, around itself. And we end up, uh, as you can see here, with, what, with that, that double curvature. So a curve in section, but also in this case, a curve in plan, right? A circular plan is the kind of classic dome. Uh, circular or parabolic section uh, is, the, is the kind of classic profile. And we'll look at what happens when 
um, we have a, a monolithic structure that's curved in those two directions. And very much analogous to the slab, what we'll find is that because loads can flow uh, in two different ways, we get added efficiencies, added effectiveness. And a dome can span much further for the same amount of material uh, than an arch or an extruded arch. The really cool thing is that that double curvature can go in multiple directions and we can get much more complicated shapes uh, than simple domes that might respond to either functional or architectural desires that, that we or our clients might have. We can do the same thing then with vector active structures and we can take a, a simple one-way truss and we can certainly bend it around uh, a, an arch shape or a beam shape as we've seen but we can set those trusses at right angles to one another and get the same efficiency that we get with a, a two-way slab or a, or a waffle slab. We're then hacking a bunch of ideas together. We're taking the, the, the efficiencies of a vector active system and we're kind of multiplying them by adding the efficiencies of a two-way system. We'll talk about space frames and why these are the most efficient um, simple uh, long span structures we can we can get because they're layering all these ideas on one another. We'll also talk about how we can take uh, vector active systems and either hack them together with uh, arches, domes, doubly curved surfaces uh, and get really really efficient what we call space trusses. Uh, trusses that uh, work on a number of different principles all at once. You may be sensing a theme here, which is that we have all of these kind of tools, section active, form active, vector active, one way, two way. And the more we can combine these, the more we can hybridize these, the more efficient the structure is likely to be. Maybe the more complicated, but complexity and efficiency kind of go hand in hand when we're talking about long span structures. Structures that are more difficult to calculate are often more redundant, have more load paths, therefore uh, are, are more efficient. Structures that have more complex, doubly curved shapes, definitely more effective, but also much more complicated to build. And this is constantly going to be the trade-off. Do we want the structure that uh, works the best, that uses the least material, that is the most efficient, or do we want the structure that is cheapest to build? Uh, that, that, that uses the, the least amount of sort of brain power or, uh, or, or, or labor or uh, fine uh, precision work uh, on site. These are always going to be the trade-offs that we have with, with, with long span structures. When we're talking about one-way systems, we're usually taking one section, and it may be a section that is an arch, maybe a section that's a beam or a portal frame, or trust, something like this, and we're repeating it over and over again. We're basically taking that principle and extruding it along one axis. This is why we call it one way, right? It spans in one direction. And no matter where we take the section in that, that building, we're getting basically the same performance. We may tweak um, the, the, the structure depending on uh, where it is, in the, in the, whether it's at the ends or the middle. We may change the shape of it because of some functional consideration, but basically we're spanning in one direction and extruding in the other. So the, the one-way designation comes from the fact that the span goes in only one direction. There are a lot of advantages to this. Um, once we have designed one section, we have maybe designed the entire building. Right? So there's a, a, a kind of efficiency in the design labor if you like, of a one-way system. Um, they're predictable, they're relatively easy to calculate, uh, and they are uh, simple to arrange. Um, easy to build because we're basically doing the same task again and again and again, setting up in the case on the right here, uh, one typical portal frame, fabricating that dozens of times in the factory, bringing it out and doing the same task of, of assembly uh, over and over. Fewer connections, we can do most of those connections maybe in the shop on a, on a simple portal frame. Once we get the things on site, we're just putting maybe the purlins or the, or the cross bracing uh, into them so that the construction is relatively easy. 
Our engineer is going to like this because it's easy to trace the load paths. They only have one axis to worry about, and they're going to be able to calculate that relatively easily. Right? You could almost go out and do a, a portal frame calculation right now, knowing what you know from, uh, from beam design from, from a couple of classes ago. Um, we, they're adjustable. We can uh, refine the section by kind of just adjusting proportions. And that, that profile is basically the only design decision we've really got. Right? We are interested, of course, in what happens along the long facades. But really, we're, we're designing one section, and that's the kind of essence of a, of a one-way system. That section is going to be the way the structure works. It's going to be the way the space gets defined. It's going to be relatively simple. When we're talking about one-way structural systems, you can see that we have um, a, a number of different materials, a number of different uh, techniques uh, or shapes. And you can see that in most cases, we're talking about span to depth ratios that are in the kind of 1 to 20 to 1 to 30 uh, uh, ratio. Trusses are a little bit deeper, obviously. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see that uh, arches are much, much thinner. There, we're, though, we're just talking about the depth of the structure itself, and we're not talking about the height uh, of the arch. So we have a couple of different variables that, that we're taking into consideration here. One of them is how much uh, the, of the actual structure there is, how deep the actual structure is. The other is how tall the space is that we're sort of bending the structure around, if you like. And I think the really important figure is on the left. You can see that there are various types of structure that are good for various spans. So for instance, if we're doing a, a, a 20 or 30 foot span, it doesn't make any sense to, to think about maybe a, a steel arch for that. We're gonna go with something simple like a, a girder or maybe a, a rigid frame. If on the other hand, we're designing, we have to get over a space that's like 200, 250 feet, then you can see that we're much more limited. We're going to be de designing that probably out of a, a steel truss, maybe a steel arch or a concrete arch, and that's going to be just about it, right? We don't have a whole lot of other uh, opportunities if we want to stick with a, with a one-way structural system. This chart's going to be important. Um, it's, it's one that, that you, you should uh, save. It's a great kind of a guide to thinking about uh, what sort of systems you might use for what kind of span and also the typical depths, typical depth to span ratios help to understand how much section you need to reserve basically for the structure when you're doing your preliminary uh, planning for, for a long span system. So what have, what's a two-way system then and, and why would we use that? Well basically anytime we're taking uh, a structural a long span principle and setting it at right angles to itself, or, or not even right angles, but just any time that we have two different directions uh, where the structure is spanning and where those are interlocked, we have what we call it a two-way long span. So again, think of a, a beam being a one-way system and a slab where you have beam action in two directions being a two-way system. Analogously, we can think of almost any long span principle form active, vector active, or section active, set at angles to itself being what we call a two-way system, right? spanning in two directions. These are always more efficient in the way they use materials because we have those multiple load paths, right? more directions for loads to flow, more uh, elements or more areas of the, of the structure to help carry that, those loads. And therefore, we can typically span farther and we can also carry more loads than a, than a one-way system. So more effective and more efficient. Um, if you get the shape right, right, if, the, if you think carefully about what the shape really wants to be, um, you can uh, come up with shapes that, that, you, that waste almost no material thickness. In other words, you're exercising all of the material in a two-way system to its uh, maximum design capacity. And any two-way system has what we call redundancy. So because there are multiple ways for the, the loads to flow, um, this not only increases efficiency, but it also increases safety. If the structure gets damaged in some way, uh, loads can flow around the area that's, that's damaged. And we see this in shell construction 
Um, there are famous examples, for instance, of, uh, of concrete shells uh, being uh, bombed or being uh, damaged by impact somehow and, and still standing. The disadvantages are mostly in the, the design process. They're much more complicated. The, way they, uh, the, the, the ways that they work are harder to understand, harder to calculate, harder to analyze, and usually these systems are harder to build. Double curvature is a tough thing to achieve on the job site for sure, but also even in, in factory conditions. We can compute these much easier now. We have much better digital models uh, than we had even 15 or 20 years ago, um, but they are still what we call indeterminate. We don't always know how the loads are gonna be shared in the, in the multiple directions that we have. When engineers calculate these very often, they're using statistical methods more than the, the kind of precise mathematical methods that we've used to calculate beams. And finally, these are a, a pain on site or even in fabrication. Double curvature means a lot of very precise, but also um, uh, very, very different pieces that have to go together, have to get fabricated to very, very tight tolerances, and there are lots of connections. And that leads both to extended fabrication time and also time on the job site, often with skilled labor trying to put these things together. So more expensive to build, less material, therefore often less of a, a carbon cost, um, and also much more efficient once they're on site. Right? They take up less volume, uh, typically, than, than one-way systems. Um, they also, architecturally, right, can be much more interesting. Two-way systems, because of their double curvature, have kind of more remarkable spaces. Domes are more interesting than arches. Uh, shell, concrete shells certainly are much more interested than much more interesting than, than arches. Um, but you can imagine some of the issues here. If you look at Richard Rogers Millennium Dome, um, you can see that they have to design all of this fabric to, to conform to very, very complex uh, geometrical arrangements, right? All of those little fabric panels are these sections of a sphere, not sections of an arch. So they have to be uh, cut. They have to be sewn uh, to achieve the kind of doubly curved surface that, that a dome requires. And if you've ever done any sewing, you know, tried to, to fit a, a shirt around a, a round human body, you know that this requires some very, very complex geometry. When we get into two-way uh, long spans, you can see that um, we're talking now more about height to span ratios. So this is um, not so much the, the, the thickness, but the height to span is, uh, again, the, 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 talking about the shape of the space that we're wrapping these around. And you can see that in terms of typical thickness, we're very, very thin, right? Thin shell domes are usually anywhere between three and six inches, and yet they can span up to 240 feet. So the, the, the span to thickness ratio is almost infinite. It's the height to span, how much kind of curvature we need in the system to, to get it to work that is, is something that we're really concerned with. And you can see right away that we are never going to use any of these for multi-story buildings because they require so much height uh, to get them to work. But you can see that, first of all, we're talking about very, very efficient use of material, um, hundreds of feet of span for inches of thickness. And we're also talking about spans that generally are, uh, can be larger than for many one-way long span systems. So suspended cable structures, here you see 450 feet. I'm here to tell you that, that can, uh, you can take that up to about 10 times that, right? The Golden Gate Bridge is 4,000 feet uh, in span. But you see that in general, we're talking about uh, spans that are well over uh, or up to or and over 100 feet. So really, really big, like stadium size spans. We're very often going to go to two-way systems because that's, that's uh, the, where the efficiency uh, is going to make the most difference. Um, one way to think about the difference between one-way and two-way spans is to uh, look at uh, domes, which we're all you know, familiar with. If you've been to Rome, you know the Pantheon, maybe the most famous, the kind of uh, original dome uh, in, in, in Western architecture. Um, and what's interesting about uh, 
ancient Roman domes is that for our purposes, um, we can look at them and we can talk about the difference between one-way and two-way structures looking directly at um, these ancient examples. The Pantheon, you would think, looking at it, is a, a two-way system. It has curvature in section. It has curvature in plan. That means that architecturally, that dome is a doubly curved structure. Right? It has these two different uh, curvatures, one in section, one in plan. What we uh, know from the Pantheon, though, is that it has these radial cracks. They've been plastered over uh, in the Pantheon because people don't like uh, buildings, concrete buildings with huge cracks in them. But if you look at other Roman examples, uh, you see these very, very distinctive cracks that radiate from the oculus uh, down to the, toward the foundations. And what over time structural engineers have recognized is that this makes perfect sense. There's nothing holding Roman domes together uh, at the base. And if you think about um, how a dome would fail, right? If you push down on a dome hard enough, how is it gonna fail? It's gonna fail by uh, breaking around the perimeter uh, and spreading out. And in fact, that is what all Roman domes have basically tried to do, right? All of these domes have these what we call meridional uh, cracks. And what a structural engineer would say is that, okay, well, this makes this into uh, not a two-way structure, but a whole series of one-way structures, right? The Pantheon, other Roman domes that have this cracking uh, work really more like a series of arches. And you can see here on um, this diagram that's explaining how this works, each one of these little tabs is functioning like a one-way arch. They are arranged radially, but if you think about the Pantheon, it needs those uh, you know, sort of 20 foot thick walls around the exterior that are working basically like buttresses to hold all of those little arches uh, up. The difference between that and a modern dome, and here, Nervis Palazzetto dello Sport, the dome that we'll come back to over and over again because it, it, it kind of wears its, its long span principles on its sleeves, the Palazzetto and all other concrete domes work by holding the base together. And you can see that Nervi's dome here is held together, not only held up, but also held together by all of these buttresses around the perimeter. Those buttresses resist the thrust of the dome, right? If you think of it, uh, think of it first as an arch, Right, those buttresses are resisting the thrust of the arch, so very much like the, the walls of the Pantheon. But what Nervi's dome has that the Pantheon doesn't is it has this edge condition that allows for reinforcing, right? Reinforcing steel that goes around the perimeter of the dome. In Nervi's case, the reinforcing is actually uh, also buried under the, uh, the, the buttresses in a giant uh, tension ring. But that steel holds the dome together, it provides what we call hoop strength, resisting the tendency of the dome to flatten out. And so a modern day dome doesn't crack. And because it doesn't crack, it maintains continuity in those two axes, right? It works as a sectional arch, and then it works also as a tension ring around the outside. And what that does is it maintains that double curvature uh, and makes the dome work not like a series of arches, but instead like an eggshell, a monolithic two-way structure. We will talk a lot about this and try to explain it a number of different ways when we get to surface structures, but for the moment, that's what I, I want you to think of when, you, when we talk about one-way versus two-way. Structures that work like a, a whole series of disconnected arches, those are gonna be one-way structures, and, and we might lay those out uh, in an extruded fashion. We might make a sort of pseudo dome like the Pantheon, but not worry about holding the arches together so much as buttressing them around the edges. Those are both one-way systems. Nervi's dome where you're forcing the, the, the dome to be monolithic, holding it together, preventing it from cracking, and making it work in those two directions, that very clearly is a two-way structure. And again, we'll show example after example try to get our head around what, what, why that works and, and why that uh, is so uh, effective.
And then just a little bit of a preview, the, the great advantage to one-way versus two-way systems architecturally is that when we talk about double curvature, we can certainly see that double curvature in a dome where we have the section curving uh, in one direction and the, the, uh, the, the plan curving basically in the same direction, right, and closing a space. But so long as we can trace two curves that are in different directions or even different shapes across the surface of, uh, of, of our structure, we will get that double curvature and we find that we can make an infinite number of surface geometries that will work, that will uh, be what we refer to as double curvature. We can make them kind of any form we want. Some will be more efficient than others, uh, but any doubly curved surface can structurally be made to work. We'll talk a lot about the difference between those and what we call a developable or extruded or one-way uh, surface structure uh, and why these are so much more efficient but also so much more complex than the simple extruded like barrel vault that, that, that we're used to seeing uh, in, in Roman architecture in particular. And finally, we'll talk about uh, ways that we build these, like kind of hacks to figure out um, how we can build these very complicated doubly curved surfaces uh, using, paradoxically, straight lines. Uh, ruled surfaces are a particular type of doubly curved surface, one that uh, we see most often in building because it gives us a way to readily form or to easily make, fairly easily make, um, those complex uh, doubly curved surfaces that are so efficient. And I would argue um, these give us a little bit more uh, architectural interest than if we simply show up uh, with some wild and crazy freeform uh, curve that, that, that um, is both tough to build and also doesn't really resolve itself maybe uh, quite so well visually. Okay, um, we will leave it there. Uh, long span structures, again, um, pros and cons, like very, very efficient, but also uh, prone to rather dramatic failures. And uh, here, uh, a pneumatic structure that has failed dramatically and that has gone from being a pneumatic structure uh, into a, a two-way form-resistant uh, cable-supported structure. Um, not the intent of the engineers, but nevertheless, uh, one of these examples of redundancy, of safety uh, in doubly curved long spans that, that we'll get to more and more. We'll dive into all of these topics in greater detail over the next series of lectures. We will look at uh, long spans basically by type. So starting with section resistant, we'll take the beam theory that we know, uh, look at how we can both hack it and look at how we can achieve it using uh, folded plates instead of something like uh, I-beams uh, to carry those loads over both longer spans, but also to expand those beams into uh, elements that have a covering function in addition to uh, a structural one. That will be uh, in lecture two, and then we'll go on to look at the various other types, uh, structural types, based on uh, these kind of families of form active, surface active, vector active, uh, and section active.